All right. Well, good afternoon, friends. Um, it's good to be here with you today. I'm glad. I'm feeling hopeful about our meeting after church, especially now that pizza is part of the deal, right? Um, and about our work together to make six eight a self-sustaining organization. So maybe self-sustaining doesn't sound super romantic when I say it that way, but another way of saying it is that if we can get to a place of being self-sustaining, then 6-8 will be able to keep doing the great things that we've been doing for the long haul. Justice, community, spirituality, which is a very good thing. So uh, I want to say a few thank yous before we get started. Um, first, thank you to the folks who've already uh, made financial pledges in the fall and started fulfilling them. And thank you to everyone who volunteers time and care and hard work and stuff. And thank you to everyone who keeps us in prayer and spreads the word and invites friends along. Um, and a special thank you to Emmanuel for all the work he's put in this year, especially in the last few weeks. And like dealing with, in this week he's probably gotten like 18 emails from me. I'll be like, oh, did you think of this? So thank you, Emmanuel. So all this together has been invaluable for our success. So that's all. So that's enough for now, I think. But let's pray. Please pray with me. Loving God, you promise water to all who thirst. Give us the water of life and strengthen us for your life, a life of trust, gratitude, and hope. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So as a part of my ordination process, years ago, I went to a career counseling center to undergo a battery of tests. Um, and one of them was called the MMPI. And the basic idea, do, do you know what this is? Okay, so the basic idea is to see if I have any undiagnosed mental health problems, right? And some of the questions are, the, you know, it's good that they check pastors for these things, right? All right. And so some of the questions are a little weird. They're things like, do you ever have sensitivity or soreness on the top of your head? And you're like, what is that? All right. Or maybe more obviously, do you ever hear voices of people who aren't there? I think they just went out and came right out and asked that. And it was pretty clear to me what the answers to those questions should be, right? But there was one that I just didn't know what the right answer was. And that was, I know who is responsible for my problems. And you either answer yes or no. Because on the one hand, if I say no, then it means I'm not really willing to take responsibility right? For the various problems I have in my life. Um, maybe the ones I could do better about addressing. But on the other hand, if I say yes, doesn't it sound like a little paranoid? Like, yes, I know who it is, and it's the CIA, <laughs> and they're in a conspiracy with the UFOs, right? So it could go either way, kind of, you know? Paranoia, irresponsibility, choose your poison. So if I remember right, I think I went with um, paranoia. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. Paranoia. Hooray. Well, I don't know. Maybe that was the right answer. I don't know. No one ever gave me the, the um, answer sheet. But the question of who is to blame or who's responsible for our problems is one that has a long, long life in human history. So many ancient religious traditions included ritual sacrifice as part of their worship as a way of assigning blame and relieving the tension that we all deal with when we have to live with each other, right? After all, it's not easy, if you're not of the most mature mindset, to be upset when your friend has a bigger herd of goats than you do, or a better campsite overlooking the river, or when they have a nicer house or a newer car, or when they become the youngest president in the history of the National Council of Churches, or a keynote speaker at a big church meeting you go to, or they manage to do the exact thing you're trying so hard to do, but clearly they're doing it much better, uh, with a much better sense of organization and lots more help, and wearing better clothes. For example, I'm just putting out imaginary scenarios here. None of this is real, right? All right. Anyway, you, can, you could laugh at that. I, okay. So in our story today, the chief priests and the Pharisees are dealing with some of their envy of Jesus. He's preaching an amazing word from God and from himself as God. If you are thirsty, come to me. And if you trust me, if you believe in me, drink. And a lot of people are impressed. And they decide he's someone special. He's an important prophet or possibly even the Messiah. 
The temple guards even are, are, aren't even immune. When their bosses question them, why didn't you arrest him? Their response is, we've never heard anybody talk like that. It was amazing. Did you see it? And you can tell that these authorities aren't thinking logically anymore, that their fear and their jealousy is getting the best of them. Because when Nicodemus tries to call them back to encourage them to live by the law and by their better angels, they turn on him too. Doesn't the law say we should listen before we judge? Nicodemus asks. Oh, are you from Galilee too, Nicodemus? They shoot back. He can't be the prophet if he's from Galilee. It's in the Bible. God said it. I believe it. That settles it. Right? They're closed down. And it's a sign of what we know will happen when they do get to manage to get their hands on Jesus. And he becomes a human sacrifice. Because eventually that's where the story leads. It's not an official t- practice at the temple in Jerusalem, but Jesus' death and the death of hundreds and thousands of others in Judea, in a Judea that's occupied by Rome and bursting at the seams with tension, are in many ways human sacrifices. People killed not because they really deserve it or because they're so dangerous to their fellow human beings, but because they've been assigned the blame. They're going to stir up rebellion. They're going to upset the system we're working so hard to maintain. And so for the greater good, they have to die. Jesus has to die. And if you've ever been in a group or an organization that has a scapegoat person, the one who always seems to get blamed for everything, you know that when the person decides to leave or they get pushed out, the things improve. Or at least they improve for a while anyway. But then somehow a new person will arise to fill that place of annoyance and disruption. <laughs> What's that, the president? Yeah, the president is all, yeah, that's right. The president always gets this focus of, um, as Parker Palmer puts it, thinking about community, a community is that place where the person you least want to live with always lives. <laughs> So the chief priests and the Pharisees are hoping that if they can just arrest Jesus and get rid of this person they least want to live with, that their problems will be over. He'll be out of the way and done with, and they don't have to deal with him anymore. That's what they imagine will happen anyway. And if we step back for a minute to look at the Gospel of John, we can see the same dynamic here in what the Gospel is doing that the very early Christians who wrote this version of Jesus' story were having their own problems with the priests and the Pharisees of the Jewish establishment. So in a lot of the stories we've been reading from John during this um, season and what we'll continue to read, especially going into Lent, not just this one, the Jews get a lot of blame. The Jews reject Jesus. The Jews are out to get him. The Jews are 100% responsible for his death. You hear this over and over in John. But the context that we miss out on, and that many Christians missed out on for many centuries of Christian history, is that all the people in these stories, unless they tell us otherwise, are Jews. Right? Jesus is a Jew, and his disciples are Jews. And he and they are living out their identity as Jews. Even the community where the Gospel of John was written was a group of Jewish Christians. But they were in the middle of a fight with the Jewish establishment of their day, and they're feeling rejected and cast out and angry. And when Christians in later years lost sight of that context, we started doing our own scapegoating of Jewish people. We didn't see a key and central point of Jesus' death and resurrection, which is, you know, stop scapegoating. Stop blaming other people for your problems. Stop casting people out. Stop hoping that if you can purify the community that there will be peace. Stop doing human sacrifice. Which is easier said than done, of course, since it can be so unconscious, it can be so invisible. But there is hope in what Jesus preaches in the text today. Come to me, he says. If you are thirsty, come and drink. And out of the believer's heart will come streams of living water. If we can find our grounding in God, if we can receive the water of life from the one resurrected from death at the hands of the crowd, if we can be present to the source, to the Holy Spirit, it will quench our thirst like fighting and blaming and casting out will never ultimately do. The path forward is not casting out and cutting off, but forgiving and reconnecting and living in gratitude with our trust in God. When Jesus is resurrected, he doesn't come back 
and take revenge on the people who betrayed and abandoned him, or even the ones who condemned and killed him. Instead, he simply refuses to be invisible. The authorities, the crowd, wanted him to go away, to be invisible, to disappear, but he doesn't. He comes back. He shines a light on the truth of what really happened to him. And then he forgives and he reconnects. And in the process, he starts a whole new way of life. Are we thirsty for that new life? Are we thirsty for a world where no one is cast out or cast aside? Are we thirsty for a community that welcomes all, for God's forgiveness and each other's? Are we thirsty for a life of gratitude and of trust? Jesus says, Come, all who are thirsty, and I will give you drink. May we all come to Jesus to drink and be satisfied. Thanks be to God. Amen. So let's continue um, with some time for reflection. And then if you can scroll ahead, I think I do have a question up. So why is it so tempting to blame other folks or to get into picky fights? And as always, general response to the sermon.